Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have with us a beat artist who works both from Vancouver, Canada and the UK, uh, Sharmini Veera Sekara. And I'm very excited to introduce uh, you all to her. Um, her work is very intricate and ornate, and uh, it's very easy to get lost in the details of her work. And that's what I enjoy the most about it. Um, her work um, is in the permanent collections of the Museum of Art and Design in New York and Henry Ford's uh, glass collection in Michigan. So I'm going to hand the mic, so to speak, over to Sharmini. And uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anvi, for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Uh, so would you like to start uh, by telling us something about you that I haven't mentioned already? Uh, yes, I uh, grew up in Sri Lanka. I was born and I grew up in Sri Lanka. And, uh, I, you know, in Sri Lanka, it wasn't, when it came time to choose a career, it wasn't something that art wasn't something that was, you know, encouraged at the time. I, that was in the 70s. And right. what was encouraged was, you know, doctor, lawyer, accountant, that kind of thing. And so I opted to become an accountant. However, yeah. I always had a very strong interest in art. My mom used to do batik and embroidery. And so I was around that kind of, uh, I would say, craft. And yeah. um, I had a strong interest in it. But of course, I, it was not a career choice at, at the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was a completely different era altogether that I grew up in pre-Google, pre-internet, all of that. So you right. got your information. It wasn't a global society, as obviously. So you got your information from uh, local sources. And anyway, as I mentioned, I went on to do accounting, but I always did in the background, I would do um, sort of art courses, pottery, that kind of thing, you know, more with a hobby. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was how uh, I grew up, specialized in accounting. And I worked as an accountant for 12 years, including a two year stint in Holland. So I can't say I have any regrets. As to my career choices, it just uh, took that much longer to get to beading, I guess. To get to beading, that's lovely. That was, in fact, one of the questions that I did want to ask you, uh, because I read that you switched to being a full-time artist about 30 years ago now. And yes. what, what, what made, what brought you to that decision to switch from accounting to um, being an artist full-time? Uh, well, it wasn't really a decision. It was a very gradual process. Um, uh, we, uh, after I got married and I had my daughter, we moved to Canada. That was like mm -hmm. 35 years ago. And when I got to Canada, it was if you wanted to continue as an accountant, you know, to get somewhere, you have to do the take, retake all the exams. And I wasn't really wanting to do that. I did right. work part time as an accountant, but uh, not at the level I left when I left Sri Lanka and right. then I started uh, I discovered actually the community colleges and started dabbling in all kinds of uh, craft courses from paper making to jewelry making to even furniture restoration and uh, uh, silk painting and then we settled uh, down in an area that was very close to a, a college that offered a textile program so I, with, uh, with my husband's encouragement, I signed up for a two-year program in uh, textile arts. Oh, wow. And, yes, and then for uh, some years, I, after I passed out, I was painting on silk. That was mm -hmm. something I did. Uh, to, uh, I also sold my work. I did scarves and wearables. And, uh, and then I joined the Vancouver Guild of Fabric Arts. And they offered workshops to their members and one of the workshops offered was beading. And that is how mm -hmm. I got introduced to beading. This, uh, the instructor, Joanne Waters, who uh, subsequently has become a good friend and the leader of our beading group in Vancouver. She offered this course and she brought along these wonderful samples and I just was so fascinated. And I took the workshop with her and I learned um, uh, Toyota bead weaving. And then I went on to teach myself other techniques. And, other uh, techniques. Yeah. And wow, then that's... I switched from uh, silk painting very gradually to beading. Beading. That's absolutely amazing because uh, a whole bunch of us are all connected by this material that is beads. 
but every single person uses them in such a different way. It's it's very interesting how it's still one material, but with the different stitches that people are comfortable with, with the kind of colors that people use. And then of course, the kind of designs and final pieces that people make, everything is so drastically different and everybody has such a distinct style. So- It is um, indeed very versatile, yes. Yes, absolutely. So, um, and your pieces specifically are characterized by these intricate designs and patterns that almost look like they draw inspiration from uh, a lot of traditional craft or ancient pieces. So where do you draw your inspiration from? Oh, that is uh, interesting. Well, I draw my inspiration from a lot of uh, sources. I love traveling and when I travel, I tend to immerse myself in the culture and very often a lot of my pieces have a cultural reference. That is Mm -hmm. uh, one of them. And then I also like architectural uh, references, sort of the very intricacies, uh, intricate uh, sort of tile work and mosaic work and that kind of thing is very appealing to me. So that's another one. And of course, nature. I love trees. A lot of my work has been sort of... uh, trees and leaves and that sort of motifs. And there are some artists also that I'm very inspired by. One of them is William Morris, a lot of my work. He's, he's a very famous arts and craft uh, designer uh, from, from the UK in yeah. the early 19th century. Um, or maybe, yeah, no, well, 19, I can't exactly remember when, but he's been around a long time and his work is very, very uh, uh, famous and uh, sort of you see it a lot in England in in many uh, museums and uh, buildings so he was uh, also a great source of inspiration and I would say William B. Morgan I like Monet's paintings I like Gaudi I like Klimt you know that mm-hmm. sort of uh, intricate uh, uh, design work that comes across from those artists I, I use as my inspiration as well. Absolutely and you can see like all of these artists that you mentioned you can see how much they've inspired you in your work and um, if you're okay with it I'd actually like to share the presentation of your work uh, at this point so um, we can also share with people what the work looks like. So this piece uh, is called Koi with lotus leaves and I did it in the shape of a tree Uh, It's the koi fish, as you can see, and the tails I have uh, sort of positioned so that they look like the trunks of a tree and the leaves are uh, lotus leaves. And it's about, uh, I would say, about eight inches by eight inches in uh, measurement. It's a Mm -hmm. wall piece. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And I see uh, your inspiration from nature that you were talking about. Yes, in that, yes. This piece was inspired by Tiffany stained glass and it's mm-hmm. called uh, Butterflies, I think. Uh, Tiffany Butterflies, something like that. I don't quite remember. It's, <laughs> it's also absolutely well, beautiful. It's a tree. Thank you. Yes. And it's uh, very, very detailed. I, I think my style is maximalism. <laughs> if there is oh, I love it. Like I love it. I'm also like that. And um, maximalism is definitely a concept that I believe in. So... Yeah, so could be over detailed but that's you know that's how I work and that's what uh, makes my work I guess identifiable with me so that that is a that piece was inspired by Stephanie stained glass stained glass that's amazing and uh, roughly how how much time do you spend on a single piece oh this piece if I sat at it I, as you know beading is very very slow it's like yes, kind absolutely. of like watching grass grow yeah, but it uh, this piece might take me about three weeks if I say roughly five to six hours a day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, that's that's amazing. That would be approximately, that's uh, approximately the amount of time that you would spend on a certain piece, and with something so detailed and intricate, I'm sure uh, there's a very regimented design process that goes behind it. And I have been following your Instagram for quite a few years now. And though images from your, like process images from your Instagram are something that I always find so fascinating because um, it's a piece of graph paper with a very intricately mapped out design that 
I'm assuming you're then following. So could you please tell us a little more about your design process? Yes, yeah, so what I do is uh, I would do a lot of sketches and then I would do a paper model of the piece that I'm going to do. And then I would translate that paper model into the, the specs for the uh, coyote graph weaving. The technique I use is coyote for this piece. Mm -hmm. So it, that would be like um, when you count the squares horizontally, it would be 19 squares to an inch and vertically 15 squares to an inch. And then I would translate the measurement of the paper model onto the uh, coyote graph paper. And I would hand draw everything. I would hand draw really the outline first, mm -hmm. and then I would fill in uh, fill in the pieces. But uh, as you can see, I have a reference there. This is a piece from uh, Gaudi. Mm -hmm. uh, the piece there you can see is the uh, uh, mosaic wall, uh, the piece that you see in the screen. And yes. then I'm sort of using that as my inspiration to work out the. This is a, this is also another tree that I did using the Gaudi inspiration it's not obviously an exact copy but it's certainly no of course not something that it inspires me that you drew inspiration from that absolutely That's amazing right. i i do have a few more process pictures because i just think they're so amazing and tell us so much about thank you um, the work that goes behind it as you can see i have a paper model in the the piece that is the ginkgo leaf yes and uh, that's sort of how I get my dimensions for the pattern on the graph paper. And mm -hmm. I should say that I mostly use two techniques of bead weaving uh, more than others. That one is coyote and I use the Delica beads, which are these very, very tiny beads. It's mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, gosh, it's a lot of beads to a square inch. I don't, I don't quite remember how many, but it, it's a lot of beads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yes, and the global project that this uh, video is uh, going next to and supporting is all in Delicas. So um, most people watching this will know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, and these are the size 11 uh, Delicas. Yeah, so they are very small, but you know, the, you, it, the finish you get from them, they sit beautifully together and they are flat and they sort of, you know, depending on the colors you use, they reflect light in different ways. And there are so many varieties of them. There's the opaque, there's the transparent, there's the, the iridescent, there's all kinds of them. So there's a lot of choice when you put the colors together. And I, I like working with the gold quite a bit. So you will see quite a lot of gold in my work. Absolutely. And I think the beauty of using Delicas, especially with like the flat peyote stitch, is that at the end of it, it almost looks like you've created a fabric. It's a textile that you end up making because of how well the beads sit with each other. Exactly. It's the, it's the technique as well. And they're beautifully made beads. They're Japanese beads, of course. Uh, yeah, and that's what I like to work with for the most part. Okay. And then um, you shared a whole collection of some very, very beautiful pieces with us. And if you could just take us through um, some of them, that would be amazing because I'm sure it's very exciting to hear about um, a little bit about where these pieces are coming from and what you were trying to convey through each one of them. So this piece is a fairly recent piece, which I did for a competition uh, held by the new Museum of Beadwork in Portland, Maine in the US. Mm -hmm. And this piece is called Standing Out from the Crowd. It, it, if you go to the next image, it's the same piece, but the two sides are uh, different in color. So it looks okay. like two different, it's the same piece actually. So one side oh, is I... like this, and the other yeah. side is the image you saw, showed previously. Previously, I, that's amazing. I, I did not make that connection at all when I was looking at the pictures. Yeah, it's hard to tell from images, but uh, it's, it's a three-dimensional piece on a stand. So it's two different sides altogether. Mm -hmm. And why I called it uh, standing out from the crowd and why I did that was I took the butterfly image, the colors on the butterfly from the uh, reverse side mm -hmm. for the two sides. So it's like, you know, the if you look at the colors of the butterfly, it should actually be on the opposite sides, but because right. it's on, on a different side, it's that, that's how the title came about. Mm -hmm. And this piece is now in the Museum of Beadwork in uh, Portland, Maine. That's amazing. 
Thank you. This piece I did, uh, as I mentioned, I do a lot of travel and I like, uh, you know, getting immersed in the culture. This piece is called Peru mm -hmm. and it was at the National Liberty Museum and I think they sold it there. Uh, it is inspired by the, by the, uh, what is that culture they have there? Now it slips my mind, but it, it's a lot of the sort of very intricate old uh, body armor they sort of wore mm -hmm. in the, and I, I saw, came across this piece in, at the museum of Sipan in uh, Peru. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are, I think it's uh, some sort of an octopus. Mm -hmm. oh, gosh, I should have done a little refresh on that, but it's inspired by the Peruvian uh, ancient Inca, uh, maybe it's not Inca, Peruvian uh, culture. Uh -huh. And that's, yeah, it's two, two techniques. One yeah. is the, uh, right angle weave that's the more open loose weave and the other one is of course the peyote weave peyote switch yes oh there's the, and you see I, it's not terribly clear from here but you see the catfish images that 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 are sort of in reverse on the two panels on the on the sides on the sides uh, are they these uh, um sort of if you move your cursor to the middle a little bit yeah. yeah, yeah. If you go up, you will see the cat cat. Oh, the images. Yes, yeah. Yes. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Yes. Again, so much detail in just one piece. <laughs> it. I. I wish I could see these in person. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I. St I still have quite a few with me, so yeah, we are coming to visit. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hopefully, someday. <laughs> yeah. This piece is inspired by William Morris, one of my favorite designers, as I mentioned earlier, and it's from a wallpaper at St. James Palace. Yeah. Uh, that's the inspiration for this piece. Then it's also three-dimensional, and this piece is smaller than the previous uh, robe you showed. The, mm -hmm. uh, the other two would be maybe about 13 inches, and this would be maybe about nine inches in height. In height. And yeah. um, if you don't mind me asking, where did, uh, what inspired you to use this format of the robe to uh, portray uh, these pieces? You know, it, it came about gradually. I love the shape of the kimono. And mm -hmm. this is kind of an evolution of that. Mm -hmm. And it's a very easy piece to translate into beads. It's, you know, when, when it's a kimono, because it's mostly like rectangles. Right. So it's uh, easier than doing something which has a little more shape, I guess. To the it. structure of it works. Absolutely. This is a piece inspired by a Japanese plate, the style of porcelain called Imari, mm -hmm. and it's done in three sections. Uh, it's a wall piece, and it would be about eight inches, uh, or possibly about six inches in diameter. And uh, yeah, it's a frame. It's to be framed. I have a to be frame. framed. Okay. Yes. This piece I did very recently for a gallery that represents my work, Mobilia Gallery in the US in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, for a show they had. And they actually asked me to do something very similar to a piece I had done before previously, with, which had a Mexican theme. But this theme I did uh, with nature, as you can see, the, it's called uh, Jewels of Nature. Mm -hmm. And it's, it shows hummingbirds and dragonflies and uh, butterflies in the design and they Indeed. wanted the sort of the open spaces it's a neck piece beautiful and your use of color in all of these pieces that we've seen so far is so interesting and uh, do you usually draw inspiration for color from uh, the same source or the culture that inspires the work or yeah, um, well, are you looking at color uh, differently i look at color very differently depending on the inspiration so mm -hmm. this piece is obviously from nature and this is very close to what uh, hummingbirds would look like. I did do a lot of research and, you know, sometimes it's uh, they are a breed than others, but I, I think this would be a fairly representative uh, color scheme for a hummingbird. So uh, I sort of uh, went with that, but of course, you know, you put your own little take on it, like the little purple uh, parts at the end. 
uh, maybe Absolutely. not quite what was on the original hummingbird. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, so that's that's the freedom that uh, we have yeah, and one can exercise as an license. artist. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is and an I, older piece that I did some years ago, inspired mm -hmm. by Indian textiles, Paisley textiles. And uh, this piece sold, yes, it sold, it, uh, it's a fairly older piece that I did, but I do like the doing pieces in segments and then joining them. They, it kind of gives it a whole different look as to, like the previous piece was done in, in one section, mm -hmm. with, of yeah. course, with the spaces in between, but it was more or less woven as a bun piece, whereas this was done in stages and it's also different types of bead. I've used the uh, pearl seed beads for the mm -hmm. white part. So it gives it a little more texture. Yes. Yeah, it's more, uh, I would say, I, I'm not sure whether people actually wear them or it's done more as an art piece mm -hmm. and it could be displayed or framed or something, but uh, well, you know, it could be wearable. You yeah, you never know. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that is the um, last image that I have. Uh, yes, that's the last one. and. Um, I, I did read somewhere, um, and it was probably on your website, that um, it was an interest in contemporizing this traditional craft of beadwork. Because if you do study maybe, um, I want to say, several decades ago, beadwork yes. was more of a traditional craft practiced Absolutely. by uh, artisans. And you didn't see it as much in what we call um, fine art. Yes. Um, it was more um, of a traditional craft that you saw Absolutely. and um, so how if you see uh, the work from then and then now where there are so many artists wor working uh, with beads uh, and contemporary work um, yes. how, how do you think that sort of uh, change has come about and um, it's very interesting to see how things have changed yeah, so when I started, I would say about 25 years ago, I've been, be, when I first took the workshop, it was like 25 years ago, of course, it was a gradual process till I uh, got better at it. But uh, at that time, it was, it was very, very unique, like you didn't see a lot of it in galleries, and you still don't, not as much as ceramics and uh, glass and that kind of thing, but it's now being considered a fine craft. Uh, more yes. so in the US than in Europe, I would say in, in the UK, there's still uh, sort of, there's a reluctant, reluctance to, to display beadwork as part of uh, fine craft. But in fine the craft. US, it's, they are very much more open to it and you see a lot of it in galleries now. But uh, when I started off, as I said, 25 years ago, it was relatively unknown and uh, it's gaining momentum, I think, as, as time goes on. And, there are some amazing bead artists out there and they have like Joy Scott, for instance, has really brought beading to the forefront. Absolutely. So, yes. And the galleries, you know, with support from the galleries uh, who are brave enough to take on some sort of a craft that is out of the ordinary and has so many possibilities and so many different ways of, uh, you know, showcasing beads. I think it's, uh, it will it's there to stay. It's, uh, you know, like ceramics or any of those other textiles. Even textiles, I would say, took, took a while to get there to the to the forefront of fine craft. But Absolutely. Uh, it's there now. So I, I expect beads will be uh, following along shortly. <laughs> I sure hope so. And I absolutely agree with, um, you know, it being a lot more uh, visible in the fine art scene here in the US because I come yes. from India where you right. don't see very much of it at all. You see it a lot in the traditional craft, but uh, not as much in uh, galleries or in museums. There are a few artists who are, you know, beginning to try and pull it into the forefront as a craft, but right. um, not, not, not as much as you see it here. So I sincerely do hope that it grows and continues to grow yeah i think i think so because there's as i said there's more people taking it on now and then obviously that means more exposure and more you know art, art out they are made of beads or craft fine craft however you call it there are more makers doing it so uh yeah hopefully it will be 
out there one day as you know and usually when i when people ask me what i do and i if i say bead weaving they just look so blank hopefully yeah. that won't happen in a few more years so you know i hope so either either people um, look blank or then it's a direct assumption that you work in the fashion industry <laughs> Yeah, exactly, and they they are always very surprised that there is no backing. Like they think it's a, some sort of an embroidery, whereas it's a standalone piece, right? I mean, it's a woven piece, and the back and the front is so is identical, really. So, Absolutely, uh, it's it's kind of hard to explain to somebody who doesn't know what it is. It's not like any other craft where you, you say woodworking or something, and they immediately know what it is. With what weave, it is. weaving, it takes a bit of explanation. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But, you know, it's and, unique, and I like uh, like I like the fact that it's it's a niche craft and it's unique. Gives you absolutely. I I I certainly agree, and I'm so glad that there are artists like you who are really working to pull it to the forefront in and fine craft well. and art. Thank you, thank you so much. So I hope we can all continue to do this together and uh, bring beadwork to new heights. I hope so too. So thank you so much for um, joining us, and thank you so much for sharing so much of your work and your process uh, with us. We're very grateful to um, have you. you speak for us, and I hope we can keep in touch. And I will continue to follow your work and see um, all the new things that you're exploring. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure, and I do follow you too on Instagram, and I'm very fascinated <laughs> with your. Projects you are beading from one end of the US to the other end of the US. To yes, thank Central you Park so much. And all of that. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, thank you.